What's up, my people? This is Mr. Tui, creator of the SAT Crash Course Series. And in this video, I'm going to teach you the easiest and fastest way to solve questions from Digital SAT Practice Test 1, Math Module 2. If you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe down below, and be on the lookout for more Digital SAT videos coming out soon. In the meantime, enjoy these answer explanations from Digital SAT Practice Test Number 1, Math Module 2. All right, we got a question up on the screen. This is number 19. Go ahead and read question number 19 for us, please, Tanner. Which expression is equivalent to a to, uh, 11 twelfths? Yeah, a to the power of 11 over 12. Mm, okay, okay. Um, oh, and then it, notice it says also where a is greater than zero. That's part of the question mm. there, too. Now, have you ever seen fractional exponents before, Tanner, or is that kind of new to you? Um, that's a little new. It's a little new, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about fractional exponents um, real quick, kind of what things mean. I'm going to start with a, with a pretty easy example here of a fractional exponent. I'm going to start just to the right of the question here. Let's say we have 8 to the power of 1 third. 8 to the power of 1 third. Okay, what does that mean exactly? What's a fractional exponent mean? It looks kind of intimidating, but here's a little trick I'm going to teach you, and anybody watching this recording that sees a fractional exponent on the SAT, you can always do this trick. It works really, really well. You're going to turn that fraction into a flower. Okay, and here's what I mean. I'm going to take that numerator of the fraction. That's a 1 in the 1 third. I'm going to turn that into a kind of silly looking little flower here. There we go. Little flower. And then um, I, I want you to imagine that that fraction line is like the ground line. You know, it's like the dirt. And then below the dirt, we've got the root of the flower. Okay? Little root. Yeah. All right. So I've turned the fraction uh, fractional exponent into a flower. So here's the trick. It's flower power root root. And that means we're going to take 8 to the power of the flower. So that's 8 to the power of 1 because the flower is 1. And then we take it to the third root, which looks like this. Now, do you know what third root means, Tanner, or not so much? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it means there's some number, anybody watching the coin doesn't know, there's some number times itself three times, which equals 8, or 8 to the power of 1, same thing. Of course, 8 to the power of 1 is just 8, right? So um, what number, by the way, uh, times itself three times gives you 8? Do you know what number? And you say no if you don't. <laughs> There's a number, and we multiply by itself three times. It gives you eight. What number is that? Uh, it's a whole number. Mind's going yeah, make... you're good. You're good. Yeah. yeah. I'll just tell you. I mean, it's two. It's two. Because two times two times two is eight. Two times two is four, and then times two again would be eight. Yeah. So you'd say uh, the third root of eight, or third root of eight to the power of one, is two. Does that mm -hmm. make some sense? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it again. I mean, that works again for like any, any, um, any fractional exponent. Let's say we had uh, nine to the power of one half. Nine to the power of one half. Let's do the thing again. I'm going to turn that into a flower. My flowers are getting dumpier and dumpier. <laughs> That's all right. There's a little root. Okay. Great. So that means nine to the power of one to the second root, okay? Now, second root, that's just the same as square root. Like, technically, we don't even need to put this, the, the two there. If there's nothing there, it's sort of implied that it's two. We could, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same. Now, uh, what is nine to the second root or the square root of nine? What's that equal, do you know? There's some number times itself, which gives you nine. Three. Three, the answer's three. Does so that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. So this, uh, this question it looks a little bit more complicated. We've got this, um, you know, it's A, it's a variable to the power of 11 over 12, but you could do the same thing. I'm going to turn that, uh, that fractional exponent into a flower. There's the flower. There's my root. So really what that means is A to what power? It's the power of the flower. A to what power? A uh, to the 11th yeah, power? Yeah, to the 11th power, because you take the power of the flower to the 12th root. Okay. And again, that looks kind of scary, and it's like, oh, what's all that mean? You know, don't worry about it right now. Just recognize that means A to the power of 11 
to the 12th root. That's all it means. Does that make sense at the moment? Yeah. Okay. So now we got to find out which expression is equivalent to that thing right there. Now, I mean, here's the deal. If you got access to a calculator, which you do on the SAT, not, I'm not certain they have the functions here. If they do, I haven't seen the, the digital SAT cal the online calculator that they give you. If you've got like the square root or the, you know, the, the root functions where you can take, you know, a to the, you know, a to the power of 11 and the 12th root of it, you could literally just plug in a value for a, plug in like two or three for a, find out what, you know, two to the power of 11 and then the 12th root of that would be. You can just punch in your calculator. I mean, you've got like, if you've got like a graphing calculator, you know, even your iPhone that's got that function on there, you can do that. And then just punch the same value for a into the answer choices and see what matches up. You could do that. I'm not certain they have that function on there. I'm guessing they would, but but even if they don't, there's a, there's another way to do this where we can just we can take these answer choices and turn these into the fractional exponents. Okay, we can kind of work backwards. So like look at answer choice A. That's going to we can express that as a fractional exponent where A uh, where the, where the numerator is what number? Do you understand my question? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, remember, you take the power of the flower that's in the numerator. Yeah. So what's going to be in the numerator for answer choice A? If we express that as a fraction, it'll be A to the power of something over something, but it's A to the power of what over what? 11 over 12. Well, if look at answer choice A. Oh, 132 yeah, over 12. Exactly. A to the power of 132 over 12. Okay. Now, does that look equivalent to a to the power of 11 over 12? And that's the question. Does that look equivalent? No. No way, man. It's going to be way too big. I know the numbers are bigger or whatever, but like, look how much bigger that numerator is than the denominator. You know, that's good. I don't even know what 132 divided by 12 is. What, what is that? That's 10. That's 11. Oh, okay, that's 11. So that's a to the power of 11, not a to the power of 11 over 12. Does that make some sense? Why those are clearly not equivalent? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. We can do the same thing with B. We're kind of just working backwards here. We can express that as a fraction. What's that equal if we express that as a fractional exponent? 144 over uh, 132. Oh, it'd be the other way around, right? Because you take the power of the flower, which is going to be in the numerator. Oh, so sorry. It's 132 the... over exactly. 144. Exactly. Okay. Over 144. Okay. Now, does that look like that could be equivalent to... The expression in the question. Yeah. It could maybe. be. Yeah, it could be. In fact, like, maybe we can confirm that. I'm going to express 11 divided by 12 as a decimal. So I'm just punching that in the calculator. You'll definitely have access to that on the calculator. So 11 divided by 12 is what? 0.91. Yeah, roughly. Six, it's like, six, yeah. Six, six. yeah. Yeah, it's like 0.916 repeating basically. Yeah. Right. And let's see what 132 divided by 144 is. Huh. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So I think we can confirm answer choice B. I mean, on a time test, you could probably stop there because that works. Does that make sense? How you can sort of reverse engineer that, turn that to the fraction form of the exponent. Yeah. And it's just like, okay, which one's equivalent to 11 over 12? That's the only, that's, that's the question. Let's just continue practicing. I, I want to uh, make it clear why it's not C and D. If we turned C into a fractional exponent, what would that look like? It'd be A to the power of what? 132 over 121. Over 121. And we know we don't even have to calculate what that is because the numerator is bigger than the denominator. That's going to be bigger than one. And we know 11 over 12 is not bigger than one. So that doesn't work. And then look at answer choice D. A to the power of what? 132 over 11. Yeah, so that's not going to work either. That's way too big. So those are gone. We can confirm it's B. I'm going to double check the answer. Yeah, it is B. It is B. So we're good. Any questions about that? No. It's an intimidating looking question, but if you just know that one trick, right, of the flower power root root thing, right? Take the power of the flower and the root of the root after you've turned your fractional exponent to a flower. And you just you'll keep everything straight. That's it's not too bad. They're just testing on that one specific concept here. Questions? No. All right. Great job. Okay, we're getting toward the end here of 
Module two of digital SAT practice assessment number one. Some of the, the, the questions got a little trickier. This one's not too bad. We do have some tough ones coming up. Go ahead and read question number 20. And we'll discuss solving this together. And, and an event planner is planning a party. It costs the plan, uh, event planner an overtime fee of $35 to rent the venue and $10.25 per attendee. The event planner has a budget of $200. What's the greatest number of attendees possible without exceeding the budget? Ooh, what is this question asking us to solve for here, Tanner? The greatest number of attendees possible. Yep, yep, without exceeding or going past the budget, which is a budget of $200, okay? Does that question make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, there's a way to do this with, like, setting up an inequality you know, you can sort of like, you know, like you set up an equation or something like that just with an inequality, so greater than or less than sign instead of an equal sign. Totally doable if you're like really comfortable with setting up equations or inequalities and you know the path here. I mean, you can solve it that way. That's fine. But I think there's an easier and, and a better way to do this, which is, uh, uh, which is just testing values for the, the, the greatest number of attendees. Just like play with some numbers and see what the cost is for some number of attendees. And, and if it's too small, then bump it up. And if it's too big, then just drop it down. Does that make sense? So you can kind of just test possible answers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a better path. Um, so I, I kind of want to start there. So give me a, give me a possible um, number of attendees and we'll just see the cost for, for those attendees. Now, we're, again, we're trying to get close to 200, but not above it. So give me, give me a number yeah. of possible attendees. Possible number could be... It doesn't matter where you start. I mean, you know. Yeah. 15. 15. Sounds great. Okay, so let's try 15 attendees. Now, we can pretty easily calculate the cost of 15 attendees. Do you see how to calculate that cost? Yeah. Yeah. So how do we calculate that cost? Multiply 10.25 by 15. Yeah. I'm doing the same thing here on my end. And what's that give you? 153.75. Yeah, 153. 0.75. Now that's just the cost per attendee. Do you see that? There's another yeah. cost in the question. You can't ignore that either. What's the other cost? The other cost is the overtime fee. Uh, or the one-time fee, right, to rent the venues. So that's like the rental cost. So we've got to add oh, yeah. $35 to that. Cost. Yeah. So what does that give us when we add those together? Gives us 188.75. 188.75. This is good. I mean, this is darn close, right? Because, like, we're very close to 200. We're not over. But I think we could squeeze another attendee in. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. You want to try 16? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let's make that 16. What's the, uh, the cost of 16 attendees or the, the per attendee cost? One hundred and sixty-two dollars and four cents. Well, forty cents. I got one sixty-four. <laughs> Maybe I did something wrong. Can you try it again in your end? Yeah. Yeah. I think in the last video I had some arithmetic issues, so it's it's possible it's on my end. But I got one sixty-four. One sixty-two. You got one one sixty-two. Hold on. What am I doing wrong? Ten point two five times sixteen. One five. Oh wait, what? We're multiplying by point one. Oh no, it's point two five. One. Uh, yeah, it's ten point two five. Yeah. So maybe we got that fifteen wrong too. I wonder. Hold on, fifteen times ten point two five. No, the fifteen was right. One second. Yes, 164. Yeah, yeah, 164. Okay. And then plus 35. It's 199. 199. I don't think we're going to get any closer than that. No. Yeah. Well, that's got to be your answer then. 16. Woo. Let me double check. Make sure. Yep, yeah, we are on the right track. Though. That's not bad, is it? No. That's not bad. That's not bad. Tricky part of this, if, if you're doing uh, like the algebra on it, 
And this is why I just love plugging values. If you're doing the algebra on it, you're going to get like a decimal when you solve for the number of attendees. You know what I'm saying? You're going to get like 16 point something or other. Now, if you round down, I think you, you get 16, you'd be fine. But like, you know, if you got 16.8 or 16.9, some students would be tempted to round up. But 17 attendees won't work. That'll take you over. So you got to be careful there if you are setting up the inequality. You know, just make sure that you answer in whole number form. And, and you'd have to round down here because you're not going to get some decimal of attendees. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. Questions about this? No. Okay. All right. Not bad, man. That one's not bad at all. But I love that testing answers. Even on a writing question like that, it's funky how often you can do that um, on the SAT. Okay. That's a little bit tricky here. A little bit tricky. Go ahead and read question number 21 for us, please. If the absolute value of 4x minus 4 equals uh, 112, what is the positive value of x minus 1? What? What are we solving for here, Tanner? Positive value of x minus 1. The positive value of x minus 1. We, you know, this, and the question seems to imply I think there is. There's a negative value of x minus 1 as well. Apparently, it shouldn't surprise you too much because this is we're dealing with absolute value here, and and uh, you know there could be a positive or a negative value for x here potentially. First, let's talk about what absolute value means. Are you are you familiar with absolute value? You've seen those absolute value bars before. Do you know what that means? Yeah. Yeah. What does that What does that mean? What do those bars mean? It means that whatever number is in those bars, yeah. you have to take the absolute value of the number and. Well, you have to take the number and switch it either positive or negative, depending on what the sign is already. Yeah, yeah, right. And so, like, and he, here's the key. I mean, if it's negative, you make it positive, right? You calculate what's yeah. inside the bars. If it's negative, you make it positive. But if it's positive, you keep it positive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and I do have a section on the rules uh, document. I want to go to that real quick. Hmm, let's see. I think, it's, I think it's basic concept J. I think it's basic concept J. There it is. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Basic concept J. I want, I want you to read that, that bullet point there for basic concept J, if you have that in front of you. you yeah. That? yeah. Calculate ahead. what's inside the bars. If it is positive, keep it positive. If it's negative, make it positive. Yeah. So I just want to clarify. Here's an example here. Of, you know, the absolute value of 3 minus 5. Now, of course, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. But because negative 2 is negative, you've got to switch the sign and make it positive. It becomes positive 2. If we had the absolute value yeah. of 5 minus 3, that would also be 2, right? Because 5 minus 3 is positive 2. Just keep it positive. Basically, whatever's coming outside of those absolute value bars, you're just going to make it positive. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to this question here. Now, there is there is an algebraic operation to do, like, when you, you've you got, like, <laughs> an equation with absolute value. It's super complicated, and I mess it up all the time, and I did as a student. A, a lot of students get tripped up on it. There's a better way to think about this which is just like create values here for X that are going to give us 112 on the left-hand side. That's it. We just test values. I mean, it's a lot like the last question. Just sort of a different little expression here. You know what I'm saying? Like, can you, can you come up with a value for X that you think might give us 112 on the left-hand side? I mean, it's four times something. Yeah. You know, it's got like four times 25 is 100. So it's got to be a little bigger than 25. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So give me value for X. We'll test it. Let's do 26. 26. Sure. All right. So X is 26. So we'll plug that into the expression. I'll just write it out. You, you help me calculate it. 4 times 26 yeah. minus 4. That's what we're doing here. We're taking the absolute value to that. What's well, 4 times 26? 104. 104 minus 4. And we're taking the it's absolute. 100. Yeah, it's going to be 100. So that's a little bit too small. So we need, oops, that was, that was Rex was 26. We're going to need a bigger value. Excuse me. A bigger value for X. Give me a bigger value for X. Um, let's do 28. 28. Love it. What's well, 4 times 28? 112. 112. Ooh, we're close. But it's 112 minus 4, so what's that going to equal? It's going to equal 108. 108. So I need, we need, it's got to be a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger. Yeah. 
Let's do 29. Let's do 29. What's four times 29? 116. What's 116 minus four? 112. 112. And the absolute value of 112 is just 112. It's already positive. So, the question is, uh, now notice the question here is, whoo, this is tricky. Because some students are going to do something like this, and they're going to answer 29. Because <laughs> they're like, yeah, I found what X is. Great. It's 29. But that's not the question. What's the question asking us to solve for here? What's the value of X minus 1? Yeah, what's the value of X minus 1? That's where they get you. So you got to be careful to make sure you answer in the right form here. So what's the value of X minus 1? You tell me right now. If X is 29, 20, what's the value of X minus yeah, 1? Yeah, X is 28. X is tw yeah, or X minus 1 is 28. Yeah. So that's your answer. Woo! Easy to get tripped up there. You know, even if you solve for X like we just did. Yeah. Questions about that or does that, that process make sense? That process makes sense. Yeah, man, just plug in the values there. It's just arithmetic. As long as you know what absolute value means, you're you're good. And uh, that's not too bad, man. That's really, really not too bad. I know there are some tricky ones coming up. There are, but man, this is this is definitely in your skill set and, and for most students. All right. Okay, this is a little tricky. <laughs> Go ahead and read uh, question 22 for us, please. The cube has an edge ink. Length of 62 inches, a solid sphere with a radius of 34 inches is inside the cube, such uh, such that sphere touches the center of the each face of the cube. To the nearest cubic inch, what is the volume of the space in the cube not taken up by the sphere? What? What in the heck are we solving for here, Tanner? The volume at the uh in the cube that is not taken up yeah yeah that's it the volume uh of space in the cube that's not taken up by the sphere we're gonna have to draw a picture here man to conceptualize this we're just gonna have to draw a picture um i'm gonna start <laughs> i'm gonna start by drawing drawing the cube are you cool with that if i if i draw the picture here is that all right i'm yeah. i'm very confident in my uh 3d uh figure drawing abilities here um so i'm, I'm gonna start there Boy, I just, I'm, I've talked myself up here for my drawing ability, so I hope I can live up to the expectations now. I'm going to, it's going to be good enough. How about that? There we go. All right. Let me zoom out a little bit. So there's a cube, or it's going to be a cube here. There we go. That looks more like a cube. That's pretty good. Okay. We got a little cube there. And uh, the question says the cube has an edge length of 68 inches. Do you know what that means or no? Uh, edge length yeah. of 60. It's the length. Yeah. Yeah. Just of one of the sides. Yeah. Yeah. Each of the sides, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's 68 right there. That's 68 right there. And the cube, right? So like all the sides are, you know, like equal length. Yeah. That's it. That's not too bad. Okay. Okay. Oops. Okay. And now we have to zoom out. Okay. That'll work. And then, um, now there's a sphere inside there. It's so like a round ball, right? And this, that's a little tough to depict there, but I'm just going to try and kind of draw ooh, something like that. So it's a sphere. You got to have to use your imagination. It's three-dimensional sphere. And it's got a radius of 34 inches. You know, now, do you know what that looks like? It has a radius of 34 inches? It's the space to the center. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, from the center... Oh, the center is like yeah, right yeah, there. I mean, we're, yeah, we're, we're pretty good. Yeah. So that's 34 inches. Okay. And then um, we got to figure out, like, what's the area not taken up by the sphere? So that's like the, the area, I should say, the volume sort of like around it, like in the corners and stuff like that. Does that kind of make sense, that green area? That's what we're solving for here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, the path here on this question, look, we're going to have to calculate the volume of the cube to start with. Okay, figure out that volume. But that's not bad. That's real easy. We'll talk about what that is in just a minute, what that looks like. And then we're going to have to calculate the volume of the sphere as well. 
Okay, which sounds kind of intimidating, but this is one of the equations they give you at the beginning of each module. They give you the volume of the sphere equation. So no need to memorize it. No need at all. Okay. So um, I'll show you where that is here in just a moment. But let's start with the volume of the cube. I mean, you should, you'd probably know that even if you, you know, I don't even know if they give you the volume of a cube or three-dimensional figure, but you probably know how to calculate it, right? Do you know how to calculate the volume of this cube? Length times width times height. Yeah, that's the same for any like regularly shaped three dimensional figure, like a like a shoebox or a rectangular prism. You know, same thing. It's length times yeah. width times height. So, so it's just going to be sixty eight times sixty eight times sixty eight. Or, uh, I'm making notes. This is the cube volume. Cube, yeah. Cube volume. Handwriting is awful. We're going to deal with it. All right, sixty eight to the power of three. Right, because that's sixty eight times sixty eight times yeah. sixty eight. So go ahead and uh, punch in your calculator right quick and tell me what you get. 314,432. Yeah, I got the same thing. That's a big number here. Uh, boy. Thank goodness they give us the calculator here. But that's it. The cube volume is 314,432 cubic inches. Okay, great. Now let's talk about that sphere volume. Sphere volume. Okay, and here I want to go to um, I want to go to the um, beginning of module two or module same thing module two module one doesn't matter. Do you have that in front of you where they give you all the formulas? Yeah, one second. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got in front of me right now. You you find it. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things real quick. Notice we do uh, have. Uh, the volume of a three-dimensional, you know, rectangular prism as well. They do give that to us as length times width times height. You know, for a cube, it's just the 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 each edge squared because they're all you know equal sides. Are you there yet? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, do you see where the volume of a sphere formula is? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go back to the whiteboard. And I'm just gonna copy that that formula uh, real quick. Go ahead and read it for us, please. What what's the volume of a sphere equation? Volume equals 4 over 3 multiplied by pi r to the third power. Yeah, 4 over 3 times pi r cubed, or to the third power. That's the volume of a sphere formula. No need to memorize it, just know where to find it. That's good enough. Okay, and we know the radius, right? They tell us what it is. So we can just kind of punch that in to the formula, calculate it. It's going to be 4 thirds times pi, and then what's the radius again? 34. Times 34. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Yeah, to the power of three, okay? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about punch this in your calculator, what this all means. Be really careful here. Some students are going to be tempted to like, mul you know, multiply four thirds times pi, and then multiply that by 34, and then cube everything. But that's not what that expression means, right? You're only cubing one part of that expression. What's the only part you're cubing? Or raising to the power of three? 34. Only the 34. So I might start there, just to make sure we don't mess it up. Just raise 34 to the power of three. Tell me what you get. 39,304. Yeah, that's what I got too. I'm going to multiply that by pi. You do the same thing. What you get? I got... 123,414.5. Yep. Yep. I got the same thing. Now we got to multiply that by four thirds, you know, so maybe we could like figure out what four thirds is and, you know, we could do that. Or we could just take that number we've got in our calculator right now. We're going to multiply that by four and then divide by three. It's the same as multiplying by four thirds. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So multiply that by four, divide by three. What'd you get? <laughs> 164,141.3648. I got something close. I got 164,636. Did you do some rounding somewhere? Or no? No. no? I'm going to write down what I got. <laughs> I feel pretty confident about it. Maybe I shouldn't. 0.21. Let me double check my calculations here. Yeah, double check it on your end, too. Oh, no, you were right. I was right. One hundred and sixty-four thousand five hundred and fifty-two. 
Are you, you're not rounding it up? Oh, are you using 3.14 for pi? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Ah, don't do that. Don't do that. Use the pi button. Use the pi button. Use yeah, the pi button. Easy. Yeah, that, that was the issue. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be careful if you're rounding in the middle of calculations. You know, you're, you know, I don't think it would, you know, kill you here on this question. You should still end up with the right answer. Even if you use three point one four for pi, but there's some questions, especially if it's like a write-in, where that could be an issue. Yeah, use the pi button. Yeah, use the pi button because it's it's not exactly three point one four. It's you know, a little bit different, and especially with big numbers like this, right? That's going to amplify the rounding, you know, because the the numbers are so big. So, okay. So we've got the volume of the uh, cube. We got the volume of the sphere. All we got to do is just find the difference, right? I think that's it. So let's yeah. do it. So it's three hundred fourteen thousand four thirty-two minus. Oops. So many numbers. Four. What'd you get? One hundred and forty nine thousand seven hundred and ninety five. Yeah. That's what I got too. What's the answer? Answer is um, A. It's answer say? Booyah. That's not too bad, is it? No. It looks a little scary. Man, draw that picture though. You know what I'm saying? Like draw that picture. You gotta conceptualize it the right way first, but once you kind of see it. What to do is pretty obvious. You just find the volume of each, uh, you know, each shape, the cube yeah. and, the, and the sphere, and just find the difference. That's it. That's not bad. Questions about that, Tanner? No. Okay, great job. Okay, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. This is a scary looking question, but it's not bad. Go and read 23 for us, please. What's the diameter of a circle and the xy plane with equation uh, x minus 5 to the second power plus y minus 3 to the second power equals 16? Mm, okay. What are we solving for with this question, Tanner? The diameter of a circle. Yeah, the diameter of the circle on the xy plane. Now, have you ever seen the equation of a circle on the xy axis before? Do you know what that looks like or no? I've seen it once before. Yeah. Just need to remember. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go to my rules document. I've got it on my my basic concept cheat sheet. And this is basic concept O, equations you need to know. Basic concept O. So go to that real quick. Yeah. And uh, I want to talk about this equation of a circle. There's not a lot of equations you need to know for the SAT. I mean, there's really only four of them that you kind of need to memorize. So, you know, one is the equation of a circle. Another one's the vertex form of a parabola. We, I don't think we've seen any questions with that yet. But those are on the, the uh, earlier format, the non-digital format of the SAT. I'd expect to see them at some point because I'm seeing all the same concepts so far. Quadratic formula and then know the difference of squares formula as well. We'll talk about these kind of when we see questions. Um, you know, as they arise on the practice tests. But, but let's start with that uh, equation of a circle. You do need to know it. You need to memorize it. Um, uh, you know, you're not, uh, yeah, you, you need to memorize it, basically. Not, again, not that many equations you need to memorize. Just four of them. And most students probably already know the quadratic formula. If you've taken uh, Algebra 1 or Algebra 2, you've probably seen that at some point. But you have to know the equation of a circle uh, formula. And if you do, you're going to get this answer right just by knowing the formula. So I want you to tell me, I'm going to go back to the whiteboard, tell me what is the equation of a circle formula. I'm going to write it here on the whiteboard. Parentheses x minus h, parentheses second power plus, parentheses y minus k, parentheses to the second power equals r to the second power. Okay, great. Well, let's talk about what these terms mean. First, h comma k, that's your center point of the circle. When I say center point, it's like the bullseye right in the middle of the circle. Interestingly, it's not, you know, h comma k, the center point's not on the circle, right? I mean, it's in the middle. Um, but if you know the, the center point of the circle, then you literally just plug that into the equation for your h and k values, and you've already got the left-hand side of the equation just by knowing the center point. Does that make sense so far? 
Yeah. And then that R value is the radius of the circle. The radius of the circle. Now, notice the right-hand side isn't R. The right-hand side is R squared. R squared. So you should be able to look at this equation right here that they give us in the question and tell me what the R squared value is. What's the R squared value? 16. The R squared value is 16, which means the R value, the radius value, is what? If R squared is 16, what's R? 4. It's got to be 4. The radius of the circle is 4. Is that clear? Yeah. And that's just by, like, understanding what the equation means. That's it. We can draw that out. I mean, we could also say, you know, what is the center point of the circle, by the way? If we needed that, what's the center point? What's our H and K values here? H and K values are 5 and 3. Yeah, it's 5 comma 3. Notice it's not negative 5 comma negative 3. Some students kind of make that mistake, right? They're like, but it shows up it's negative 5 and negative 3 in the equation. It's like, yeah, 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 that it is. But if H is positive, it's going to show up as X minus that number, if H is positive. If H were negative, it would show up as X plus that number in the equation, because the equation is X minus H. Does that make sense, why the, it's easy to get tripped up sort of on those negatives? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you're absolutely right. H, uh, H and K would be... Uh, would be five and three. But anyway, let's go back to the question, right? Because they're asking for the diameter of the circle. Well, this is easy because we know the radius. So what's the diameter have to be? The diameter has to be eight. The diameter is eight because the diameter is double the radius. Yeah. And there's so your answer. Eight. There's your answer. Oh, yeah. Let me give us the answer choice there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Questions about that? No. It's not that bad. Now, you got to know the, you know the definition of a diameter. I think that's something most students are pretty familiar with. But, yeah, the diameter is just double the radius or the radius is half of the diameter. Know that relationship. But I think they – I don't know if they make that clear on the equations here. Do they? No, they, they don't. But I think, I think most students are pretty familiar with that, so I think we're good there. Questions, Tanner? No. All right. Awesome job. Okay, this next one here. This is this is a tough one. Uh, it's funny when I saw this question I put up here for the first time, I was just like, "What?" And I was real confused. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, "Okay, okay, that's easy." But uh, we got to understand what this question's asking us, and then we'll find our path here. Go ahead and read question twenty-four for us, loud and proud, please, Tanner. For the exponential function f, the value of f of one is k, where k is a constant. Which of the following uh, equivalent forms of the function f show the value of k as the coefficient or the base. What are we solving for in this question, Tanner? An equivalent uh, form for the function f, which is finding the value of k. Yeah, equivalent form, which, well, it's real specific, which shows the value of k as a coefficient mm. or a base. Okay. Let's talk about what those terms mean. First, what does coefficient mean? Do you have any idea what that means? Um, yeah. What does that mean? I think so. <sighs> You've seen it before. Yeah. Let, let me give you an example. If you saw the, the expression 5x, 5 is the coefficient, basically. Mm. It's the number in front of the term, you know, the, the variable of the term that's being multiplied. Okay, if it was like seven x squared squared y something like that, the coefficient is seven. It's the the thing you're multiplying in front of you know the variable or the term. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm looking at this uh, these answer choices here. We've got a, <laughs> which shows the the equivalent form of the function that shows the value of k as a coefficient or a base. Well, there's there's some coefficients here in all these answer choices. 50 is a coefficient, 80 is a coefficient, 128 is a coefficient, 204.8 is a coefficient. Okay, sort of the number in front of the terms that we're multiplying here. Does that make yeah. some sense? Yeah. Okay, great. Now, what about a base? What does that mean here? What's a base? A base is the number behind the coefficient, right? It's the well. In this case, it's going to be the next number. It's the number in parentheses, which is the number you're raising yeah. to a particular power. 
That's the ba exactly right. So like if we saw like eight to the power of two, your base is eight. Or if we saw like ten to the power of I don't know, eleven over twelve, you know, your base is ten, yeah. right? It's the number that's being raised to the power. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Yeah. So all our bases here in these answer choices are the stuff in parentheses here. So it's 1.6 or, well, it's, it's got to be 1.6 in all of them, right? It's the same in all of them. Now, they have different exponents, but the bases are all the same. And they all have coefficients, but they have different coefficients. Does that make sense what those terms mean here in the first place? Yeah. Okay. It's pretty essential for understanding this question. Okay. Once you understand what those terms mean, the question's a little easier. Because they tell us that the value of f of 1 is k k is a constant, and k, in, in the right answer at least, is going to be a coefficient or a base in the right answer. Okay, so what that means is, if we plug in a 1 for x, because f of 1 is k, right? That, does it, is that clear, by the way? That means where x is 1. Yeah. Is that clear? Then the right answer is going to give us k, which is either a coefficient or a base in the answer choice. So like for answer choice A, we're going to plug in a 1 for x. And if, if, if we get a value of k, <laughs> that's either 50 or 1.6, it's the right answer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And for answer choice B, if we plug in a 1 for x and we get 1.6 or 80 for k, then that'll be the right answer. And we're just going to test it. Mm. Questions about that? Or does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. Some students might be able to look at these answer choices now and already see what the right answer is. I'm not going to tell you just at the moment. Let's let's test these. Let's test these. So I want to plug in a 1 for x. We're going to find f of 1, you know, basically an answer choice a. So now we're, we're, we're trying to find 50 times 1.6 to the power of 1 plus 1, which is 2. So we're going to square 1.6. Let's do that real quick. Square 1.6. What's that give you? If you're having trouble finding that square button, you can just do 1.6 times 1.6. It's the same thing. Yeah, 2.56. 2.56. Let's multiply that by 50. And what do we get? We get 128. 128, which is K. Okay, because F of 1 is K. Now, do we see 128 as the coefficient or the base in answer choice A? No. No, we don't. So it's not answer choice A. Don't work. Let's do the same thing with answer choice B. This is even easier, right? Because we're just, you know, if we're finding f of 1, we're just raising 1.6 to the power of 1. That's the same as 1.6. So literally, that's just 80 times 1.6. So let's run that calculation real quick. 80 times 1.6. Let me know what you get. 128. 128 again, right? Which is K. Do we see 128 as a coefficient or base in answer choice B? No. No, we don't. Gone. Let's try answer choice C. So we're finding f of 1 here. So this is going to be uh, 128 times 1 1.6 to the power of 1 minus 1. But 1 minus 1 is just 0. Yeah. Now, you're going to have to you know, use the, the root function on your calculator. Maybe you already know what things to the power of 0 are. We'll talk about it in just a minute. But do you know what 1.6 to the power of 0 is? Yes. What is, what is 1.6 to the power of 0? One. 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 So 1.6 power of 0 is 1. What's 1 times 128? 128. 128. I think we talked about this briefly on another question, right? That anything to the power of 0 equals 1. Do you remember that? Uh, on a previous yeah. question? Where we, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm so tempted to explain it right now. I think I'm going to do it here, actually, in just a moment. Um, I will, in fact. But for, I want to make it real clear. That's K. Do we see 128 as a coefficient or base in answer choice C? Yeah. We sure do. So it's, got, it's right there. So it's got to be answer choice C, which it is. I mean, we could plug in to D as well. I just don't want it. I mean, it's not going to give us, you know, 204.8 or 1.6 as a coefficient or base. We can stop there. It's answer choice C. Questions about that? No. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about why things to the power of 0 are 1. I think it's kind of helpful here. So just to the right of the question, I'm going to explain kind of how this works. If you saw the expression x over 5 divided by x over 3, what does that equal? you know what that equals? 
sorry, what you were breaking up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm just to the right of the question. I hope you see this on the whiteboard. Yeah. If you saw the expression x uh, to the power of 5 divided by x to the power of 3, what does that equal? Do you know how to simplify that? Yeah. It'd be uh, x to the power of 8. It's not x to the power of 8. That would be x to the power of 5 times x to the power of 3. Because think about what this means. What does x to the power of 5 mean, Tanner? What's it mean? Uh, What's it mean to raise something to the power of 5? Multiply by itself five times. Yeah. So x to the power of 5 is x times x times x times x times x. Mm. Divided by x to the power of 3, what does x to the power of 3 mean? Multiply by itself three times. Yeah. So it's x times x times x. So notice we've got five x's in the numerator, three in the denominator, right? It's all multiplication here in the numerator and denominator, so we can cancel stuff out. So those x's cancel out, those x's cancel out, those x's cancel out. We're left with just x times x, which is what? x to the second power. x to the second power, x squared, or x to the power of two. All the same. Does that make sense why that's x squared? Yeah. Yeah. Now there's an operation you can do if you have a like base. We're talking about that term base again here which we have here in x, right? We've got x in the numerator, x in the denominator, different exponents, but the same base. If you have the same base, you can take the exponent from the denominator, bring it up to the numerator and subtract it, which gives us x to the power of five minus three, but what's five minus three? Yeah. What's, what's, well, what's five minus three, Tanner? <laughs> five minus three is two. It's two, so it's x to the power of two. Does that make sense why you can use that operation there of subtracting yeah. the exponent from the denominator? Yeah. Okay. Let me give you a slightly different expression. Let's do x to the power of 5 divided by x to the power of 5. Okay. First of all, what's x to the power of 5 divided by x to the power of 5? What's that equal? Do you know? X. It's not X. What's anything divided by itself, Tanner? One. Anything divided oh, by itself is one. one. Ten divided by ten is one. hundred divided by a hundred is one. A million yeah. divided by a million is one. Anything divided by itself is one. So even though we don't know what x is, we know that x to the power of five divided by x to the power of five has to be one because anything divided by itself is one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. let's, and you can think about it about canceling out too. It's like, hey, you got five x's in the numerator, five in the denominator. They're all going to cancel out. You're left with just one. Okay. Or we could do that operation that we just did with a like base, which we have here in x. We've got a like base. So we can take that exponent from the denominator, bring it up to the numerator, and subtract it. We get x to the power of 5 minus 5. What's 5 minus 5, Tanner? Zero. Zero. So that's x to the power of 0. x to the power of 0. So if you see anything raised to a power of 0, it's saying that that thing, that term, is being divided by itself being divided by itself. A lot of students think anything to the power of zero is zero. Now, well, anything times zero is zero, but anything to the power of zero means it's being divided by itself. So it's yeah. going to be one. Does that make sense now why things to the power of zero equal one? Yeah. Okay. Worth knowing. I've seen that pop in, in a lot of different ways on the SATs, and that's kind of helpful here in this question. Although, again, if you've got access to the calculator, you've got that exponential function, which I imagine you will have, then, you know, just punch it in. You don't have to guess. But that's why things to the power of zero equal one. All right. Let's keep rolling. A few more questions here. Ooh. Go and read question uh, 25 for us, please, Tanner. A model estimates that the end of each year from 2015 to 2020, the number of squirrels in a population was 150% more than the number of squirrels in the population at the end of the previous year. The model estimates that in the end of the end of 2016, there were 180 squirrels in the population, which of the following equation represents this model where N is the estimate number of squirrels in the population, T is years after the number of uh, the end of 2015, and T is le uh, less than or greater than, oh, equal to. So yeah, less five. than or equal to five, yeah. Oh, so much going on here. So many words in that question. What are we solving for, Tanner? 
Uh, we are solving to find an equation that represents the number of estimated squirrels. Yeah, which which one? Rep- yeah, which one represents the number of squirrels? That's it. That's what we're solving for. Okay. And uh, we're gonna plug in values here. Once again, like I, you know, structuring this expression is is not easy on your own. It's not obvious at all. But we can test values here. We can, we can test values for t. Okay, because t is the years after the end of 2015. And we know how many squirrels there are in 2016. How many squirrels are there in 2016? 180. 180. So all we got to do is plug in a 1 for t, because when t is 1, that signifies the year 2016. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that's one year after, after the end of 2015, when t is 1. Plug that in, the right answer should give us 180. And it will. Does that make sense why that's going to work? Yeah. Yeah. Let's just do it, right? I mean, like, don't try to structure it. Just, just turn it into arithmetic. So plug in a 1 for T and answer choice A. Tell me what you get when T is 1. All that is is 72 times 1.5. Yeah. 5. What do we get for the number of squirrels? How many squirrels for answer choice A? 108. 108. So that's probably not right. We're looking for 180. What about answer choice B? What's that give us? 72 times 2.5. 180. 180. Oh, that looks good. Let's test the others to make sure the others uh, don't work here, but that looks good. What about answer choice C? C, 180. Well, that's going to be bigger than 180, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, one second. just 180 times 1.5 but again that's got to be bigger than 180 1770 oh i don't well was t1 or did you square 1.5 should I just be 180 times 1.5 oh i added an extra one on the 180 oh gotcha yeah but, like, we don't even need to test answer choice D, right? Because that's also going to be bigger than 180. And we're looking for 180, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. We got the right answer. Answer choice B. Just by plugging in a 1 for T. Questions about that? No. Now, it's kind of funky, right? Because, like, a lot of students are going to see, like, oh, they see 180 in the question, and they're like, oh, it's probably C or D, right? And they're like, oh, it's a 150% increase, so it's probably, maybe it's A or C. You know, a lot of students are going to pick C here. I think when they see that 150% increase, because 150% is 1.5, but that's not a 150% increase. Let's talk about about this, you know, answer choice B here a little bit, because it's funky, right? Like we're multiplying by 2.5, but it's true. That represents a 150% increase every year by multiplying by 2.5. If you're multiplying by 1.5, that represents a 50% increase. If you're multiplying by 1.5. Does that make sense, by the way, why that would be the case? Yeah. Yeah, if it's a 50% increase, you're multiplying by 1.5. If it's a 20% increase, you multiply by 1.2. If it's a 25% increase, you multiply by 1.25. If it's a 90% increase, you multiply by 1.9. If it's a 100% increase, you're multiplying by 2. You're doubling it if it's a 100% increase. So 150% increase, you're multiplying by 2.5. You basically take the percent increase and add that to 1 to find out what you're multiplying by. In this case, it's 150% increase. 150% is 1.5. So you add that to 1, and that's what you're multiplying by. Which gives us 2.5. That's where they get the expression in answer choice B. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we've seen some of these percent increase and decrease, well, percent increase at least, questions before. Notice that like your starting value is like always the thing outside parentheses. That's the coefficient right in front of the expression. So if you just know that, you know it can't be C or D because that's what you're ending up with. It's not what you're starting with. You got to be starting with less than 180 if the population is increasing by 150%. So it's got to be A or B. B is the only one that represents 150% increase. A gives us a 50% increase every year, not 150. Questions about that? 
Yeah. But you don't even need to know all that stuff. You don't even need to know the forms or interpret them the right way or any of that if you just plug in the values. Plug in a one for T, look for the one that gives you 180. Easiest path there. Look for ways to plug in values, boys and girls. It's going to make your life a whole lot easier and your SAT score a whole lot higher. Two more questions from module two here. This one's ugly. <laughs> this is going to be ugly. Go ahead and read uh, question 26 for us. Uh, please, Tanner. Yeah. Just zoom in real quick. 5x plus Yeah, don't worry about reading that. Yeah, just jump right into the question. <laughs> yep. In the given pair of equations, A and B are constants. The graph of this pair of equations in the xy plane is a pair of perpendicular perpendicular lines which of the following pairs of equations also represent a pair of perpendicular oh lines. my gosh this is an ugly ugly question there's a lot of steps here a lot of operations we're gonna have to do but first what are we solving for we are solving for another equation that represents a perpendicular line yeah the another equation that represents a pair of perpendicular lines do you know what perpendicular means by the way yeah yeah. What, what does it mean? Could you describe it? It's kind of tough using words. I'm just going to draw a picture. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, I'm going to draw a picture. If we've got two lines that are perpendicular. Let's say we've got one line here. It's got a nice positive slope here. The line perpendicular to that is going to, it's going to like intersect at like a 90 degree angle. So you get like 90 degree angles at the point of intersection. 90 degree angle there, 90 degree angle there, 90 degree angle there, 90 degree angle there. 90 degree angles all around, roughly. I know my sketch isn't perfect here, but that's the idea. Those are perpendicular lines. Does that make some sense? Yeah. And there's something kind of special about the relation between perpendicular lines. The slopes of perpendicular lines have a negative inverse slope. Negative inverse slope. Do you know what that means, by the way, negative inverse slope? Um, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, let me explain. Let's say you've got a line. I'm just making this up. Equation y equals 2x plus 1, just because that's a nice, simple line, right? So the y-intercept is 1. The, uh, the slope is 2, positive 2, or 2 over 1, okay? The line perpendicular to that is going to have a slope that's got a negative inverse slope. So you, you can express 2 as 2 over 1. Is that clear that 2 and 2 over 1 is the same thing? Yeah. So the negative inverse of 2 over 1 is negative 1 over 2 plus b, whatever the y-intercept is, doesn't matter. Oop, one over, negative 1 over 2x. Negative inverse slope. 2 over 1 and negative 1 over 2, negative inverse. If the slope of the first line was 3, then the negative inverse of that, the, the slope perpendicular to that would be negative 1 over 3. If the slope of the first line was 2 over 3, the negative inverse would be negative 3 over 2. Does that make some sense, what negative inverse means? Yeah. yeah, I've got a section on the rules. I just want to check that out real quick, show you where that is. should be basic concept D, graphing. There it is. It's the uh, fifth bullet point. I just want to show you where it is. Yeah, you don't have to read it because it's just what we were discussing. But a perpendicular line has the negative inverse slope. Just be aware of that. Studying this rules document is pretty handy for the SAT, so I recommend reviewing it before you take that upcoming test. All right, so, um, all right, so let's go back to this question. So... Uh, we're looking for the pair uh, pairs of equations that represent a pair of perpendicular lines. So first, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take the, the equation of the question here, this guy right here. We're going to have to calculate the slope of that equation, which means we're going to have to put that into y equals mx plus b form. Once we put it in y equals mx plus b form, all we're doing is looking for the m value. That's the slope in y equals mx plus b. Does that make sense why we need to put that into y equals mx plus b form to find the slope? Yeah. Yeah. And then once we do that, we're going to put the bottom equation into y equals mx plus b form as well, and we'll figure out what a and b values give us a negative inverse slope. Then we'll know what a and b are. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Once we know what a and b are, we'll just plug those values into the answer choices and see which answer choice gives us a negative inverse slope for the equation, you know, the system of equations in each answer choice. We're going to have to kind of test them all. Okay, there's not a great shortcut I'm aware of to this question. You just got to go, go through these steps. But does that path make some sense? Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to guide you through it if you've got any questions. So let's start with the first step. Let's find the slope of this equation here. First one in the question. Basically, just put that into y equals mx plus b form. So let me see you do that. 
and uh, we'll work through this together. Do you know how to put that in Y because I'm supposed to be form Tanner? I've only done it a few times. Well, yeah, all, all you're doing, yeah, yeah, all you're doing is you're you're just isolating Y. You're getting Y alone by itself on the left hand side of the. Oh, equation. right. Yeah, once you've got Y by itself, it, it'll automatically be in Y because I'm supposed to be form, or it should be. We can rearrange it a little bit. And we're, again, we're looking for that M value, the slope. So let me see you just start yeah. isolating Y. Just using order of operations. Yeah, that's all we're doing. Yeah. Okay. All right. What are we going to do first to get Y alone? Yeah. Divide. Well, uh, no, you got to be careful here. Hold on, hold on. Stop for just a minute. So you're violating the golden rule of algebra there. The golden rule of algebra, listen very carefully. Whatever you do to one side, you do to the other side. Now, in I mean, theory, you could divide both sides by five. You, you could, yeah. but then you're also dividing, you know, seven y by five. You, you could do that. You'll get a true statement. <clears throat> but there's a simpler step that will get us closer to getting y alone. We're still not getting y alone by dividing by five. What can we do to both sides that'll get y alone? We can subtract something from both sides. That'll get us on the right path. Let me let me let me show you how to think about it. We're trying to get y alone here. Y is being multiplied by seven here at the moment. Mm -hmm. But we're also adding this five x to seven y. Okay. Now, if we want to get a term alone, do the opposite of whatever's happening to it at the moment. Okay. Now you might be tempted to like, oh, I'll just divide by seven. Well, not there yet because then we got to divide five x by seven as well, and that's just going to get ugly. I mean, you get a true statement, but but. 7y is being added. We're adding 5x to 7y. So let's do the opposite of adding 5x. What's the opposite of adding 5x? Subtract. Subtract 5x. So let's subtract 5x on both sides. And then we've got 7y. And I could write 1 minus 5x. That would be fine. But I'm going to put it in, you know, try to arrange this in y equals mx plus b form. So I'm going to put negative 5x in front of the 1 and add one. Does that make sense? Why? Yeah. Yeah, that's what, you, yeah. Th this is the same as this, by the way. It's just closer to y equals mx plus b form. That's just what we want. Now we're one step away from getting y alone. What can we do to both sides that will get y alone at this point? Divide by seven. That's when we divide by seven on both sides. On both sides. Yeah. So... Divide by seven, or I could express it because I'm dividing both those terms by seven. Negative five over seven x plus one over seven. That gives us y alone. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but our slope. Now we know our slope, right? Because that's the m value, which is in front of the x. What's our slope for this line? Slope is. It's the coefficient in front of the x term. Five. No. No. Are we still dividing? Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what the slope is. The slope is negative five over seven. That's the slope. It's the coefficient in front of the x term, in y equals mx plus b form. Negative five over seven. You seem a little confused at the moment. No. Or does it make, it make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, here's our equation. And maybe I could make it a little more clear. You know, it's, it's negative 5 over 7x. That's the same as negative 5x over 7. It's the same thing. Maybe that was a little confusing. Yeah. And uh, I've seen some students get tripped up on that. Oh, there's a wasp in my office. Dang it, I got to kill. Hold on just a second. <laughs> I got to kill a wasp. Oh, man. What are you doing in here, dude? Hold on. Oh, it's just buzzing around. <laughs> Tanner, should I leave this in the recording? Or should I get rid of it? <laughs> well, you're going to hear a thud. And uh, 
the death throes of a wasp here. I'm just meant, oh, it's kind of buzzing around my lights now. Hold on, I'm gonna get this guy. I just don't want to destroy my lights. Oh my goodness. Hold on. Stay there, Tanner. Stay there. Don't go anywhere. Yep. But I gotta kill this thing. I thought it was just a fly at first, and I was just ignoring it, but then it landed on my desk. Dude. Land on something flat and Okay. Oh, I got him now. Got him. Oh, no, I just made him angry. Okay, he's dead now. Killed him, Tanner. I killed the thing today. All right, sorry about that. I'm back. I should probably edit that out because that took way too long. Oh, all right. Um, what are we doing, Tanner? What are we doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're trying to figure out. Uh, so we got the slope is negative 5 over 7. Is that clear? Yeah. All right. So we know the slope perpendicular. Or the slope of the line perpendicular to this line. What's the slope of the line perpendicular to this line? Line perpendicular to this line is, um, I can even, yeah, is 5x plus, no, is ax plus by equals 1. Well, uh, well, I'm just worried about the slope. I actually didn't catch what you were saying. The slope of the line perpendicular to this. I don't even know what the... Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying you just you just read this, is what you yeah. read. Yeah, I mean that's the equation that's perpendicular, but we don't know what the a and b values are at the moment. But we know what the slope needs to be because the slope is just yeah. the negative inverse of negative five over seven. Yeah. What's the what's the negative inverse of five over seven? Would it be uh, positive? Yeah, it's gonna be positive. Over, yeah. Yeah, positive seven over five. Okay, positive seven over five. So what we need to do now is put that bottom equation into y equals mx plus b form. And we'll see what values for a and b give us a slope of 7 over 5, positive 7 over 5. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So let's do that real quick. Let's, uh, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll start by writing it out here on the whiteboard. So we've got ax plus b y equals 1. Okay. Let's put that in y equals mx plus b form. What's the first step here to, to put that in y equals mx plus b form? What are we going to do? You just tell me. I'll work it out. We are going to change the plus 2a subtraction problem, an addition problem to the subtraction. Right. Well, minus. what am I going to do to both sides? I'm going to do an operation to both sides. Minus. Subtract what? You're right. What am I going to subtract? Subtract a x. Yeah, yeah. Subtract a x. I know it's a little confusing because, like, we're dealing with variables here, not numbers, but it's the same process. So now it's by is 1 minus ax. Um, or I'm going to put that into y more like y equals mx plus b form. It's negative ax plus 1. Yeah. Same thing. And then what do we do to both sides? Divide. Uh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We got to get y alone. So we got to do the opposite Divide. of multiplying b. Yeah. B. Divide b. By both, on both sides. sides. So I'm just going to divide both those terms by b. Okay. Whatever b is, we don't know. But we know the slope of this line, this perpendicular line, is negative a over b. Does that make sense? That the slope of the line yeah. is negative a over b. So now we know what a and b have to be. This is a little tricky here, but what does a have to be? And what's b have to be? We know it's, it's got it's got negative a over b has to equal seven over five. We know that. So what's a? What's b? Uh, if you don't know, I can I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I know. A has to be negative seven. Mm -hmm. And oh, b has to right. be five. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I guess, I don't know if, like, A could be 7 and B could be negative 5, maybe. I don't know. But, I mean, I know <laughs> this will work. This will work. Because if I plug in those values for A and B, I'll get 7 over 5, which has to be the slope of that perpendicular line. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to kind of leave those values up there. I think we're going to need them here when we test these answer choices. Let me zoom out a little bit. All right. 
So let's go to these answer choices. Nope, I allowed him to zoom in. Let's go to these answer choices. And um, let's start with answer choice A, okay? Because we also have to see which of these, um, which of these answer choices give us perpendicular lines. Okay, we know our A and B values. So I think we've just got to find the slope of the top equation in these answer choices and then see if, uh, if and, and the slope of the bottom equation as well and see if we get perpendicular lines, see if we get negative inverse slopes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So let me just clear some space here. Let me see uh, if you can work out answer choice uh, A. Let's find the slope of the first equation. The first equation. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. So that's 10x plus 7y. Yeah. Is one. I, I can, I can, let me, let me write it on the whiteboard. I think it's just faster. Oh, you got it? Okay, you're good. And we are a lot of practice to. putting stuff into y equals mx plus b form here. Yeah. And minus 10. Looking good. X. Those cancel out. Looking, yeah, yeah. We're looking good. And then we divide. Mm-hmm. 7. Mm-hmm. Y. Same right here. Well, not 7Y. Not if you divide by 7Y, you, you're not getting Y alone. Oh, You're putting seven. Y in the denominator. Yeah, just seven, right? You're putting Y in the denominator on the right hand side. You get one on the left hand side. Too. I got you. Divide by seven. Uh, now you got to divide both terms, right? Because you're dividing yeah. seven on both sides. So the negative 10 is also being divided by seven. Yeah, exactly. So what's the slope of that line for answer choice A? Uh, and Remember, the slope is just like, it's the thing you're multiplying the x by. Multiplying the x by 10. Well, kind of. No. I mean, it, I, I would say negative 10 over 7. Yeah. Negative 10 over 7 is what you're multiplying x by. Okay. Yeah. I mean, partly 10, yes, but does that make sense why the slope is negative oh. 10 over 7? That's the m value in y equals mx plus b. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to make a note of that. So this, the slope of the top line is negative 10 over 7. What's the slope of the bottom line? If the slope of the bottom line is 7 over 10, it's the right answer. Because we're looking for the perpendicular, right? The negative inverse. Yeah. So let's find the slope of the bottom line. Now, I would plug in your A and B values here that we've got, right? We know A is negative 7. We know B is 5. So I would plug those in. This is a tough question, man. This is a lot of steps here. This is probably a good question to skip on a time test. I'm not going to lie. A lot of steps here. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. This is looking good. Uh, but B, hold on. B is 5, right? Is oh, oh, right. So you, so you, yeah, you can simplify it as, as minus 10. Why? If B is 5, does that make sense? Is that what you were kind of doing? Or just, or just leave it as, yeah. Yeah. B is 5. And Y. Mm -hmm. And Y. Yep. Equals 1. <clears throat> oh. You good? And now. Put it in Y because I'm supposed to be for him. Minus, no plus. Plus, yep, yep. That'll Seven. cancel it out on the left-hand side. Uh, now. This is looking good. Uh, negative 2 times 5 is what? Ten. Negative 10, right? Is that clear? Yeah, negative yeah. 10. 10. Exactly, right? So what? We're one step away from getting Y alone. What do we do to both sides? There you go. 
You divide, now you're dividing by negative, hold on, you're dividing by negative 10, negative 10, negative 10, yeah, on both sides. There you go, negative 10. All right, so the slope of the second line is... is 7 what? over negative 10. Yeah, negative 7 over 10, same thing. So that's not perpendicular because we need the, those are the inverse of each other, but it's not the negative inverse. If it were positive seven over yeah. ten, it'd be good. So it's not answer choice A. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy. This is not easy. This is a tough question, but is it making sense at the moment? Yeah. I'll take it. Hey, look at the answer choice B. We still know we know the slope of this of the top equation. It's the same as the last one, right? Yeah. What? Wait. What was the slope of the last one? <laughs> it was ten over seven. So we're, we're good there, right? We're st we still have 10 over 7 for the slope of this one. We just have to find the slope of the bottom one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So do the same thing here. Uh, you can work just, I'll clear some space for you. But plug in your values for A and B into the bottom equation. We'll find the slope. If we get, uh, and again, we're looking for, wait a second, hold on. We're looking for positive or negative. Do you recall if it was positive or negative? Hold on. Oh, it was negative 10 over 7. Okay, that's what I thought. So it's negative 10 over 7. So we're looking for... So we're looking for positive 7 over 10. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. And I think you're plugging in a negative 7 for A, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then it should be, hold on, and it should be minus, wait, is it minus? No, that's plus. You're good, you're good, you're good. Okay. This is looking good, Tanner. Oh, uh, Tanner, stop. Hold on. Stop. Stop for just a minute. Because this is negative uh, 7x, and you subtracted 7x from both sides? Oh. Right? You need to add, right? Is that clear? Yeah. Add. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, today has been a day so far. There you go. What's the slope of that line, Tanner? 7x over 10. Or, yeah, I would say it's just 7 over 10, right, yeah. is the slope, because that's what you're multiplying the x by, 7 over 10. Yeah. Yeah. So look at that. We got the negative inverse of negative 10 over 7. So it's answer choice B. Woo! That was a tough question, man. That was a tough question. I Really, on a time test, I, I, I'd probably recommend most students, well, I was going to say save it for the end, but... <laughs> at the end of the test but this you know if if you struggle with this one totally understandable good heavens that's very involved but does it make sense yeah yeah and i've seen some much easier questions that do test on that concept of the negative inverse slope for perpendicular lines so sometimes just knowing that is good enough to get the answer uh here it's just much more involved very high level difficulty question um but doable especially if you got time there at the end to work through and, and test all those answer choices so all right, one more question. And this question here, this is testing us on something called the discriminant. Have you heard of the discriminant before? Is that something you're familiar with or no? No. Yeah, are you familiar with the quadratic formula? Yeah. You've seen that? Okay, good. Then you know a little bit about the discriminant, believe it or not. I'll explain why in just a moment. Go ahead and read 27 for us, please. In the given equation, C is a constant. The equation has no real solution if C is greater than N. What is the least possible value of N? Oh, my goodness. Okay, this is a very, very tough question. The last two are real tough here. Um, it's not a question I would expect most students to be able to solve, to be honest with you. It's doable, and I want you to understand the concept they're testing us on because I've seen it tested in a number of ways on, on some different SATs. But you have to know something called uh, the discriminant. 
And you know you're being tested on the discriminant when they give you a quadratic equation, which we have here. Are you familiar with what I mean by quadratic, like X is raised to a power of 2? Yeah. And this is sort of like in standard form of a quadratic. They call it AX squared plus BX plus C form. That's kind of standard form for a quadratic. And... um, and if it's in standard form and they're asking for, uh, well, even if it's not standard, if it's, in, if, if it's a quadratic, and they're asking for the number of solutions to your quadratic, they're testing us on this discriminant, the discriminant, okay? Let me explain what that is. The discriminant is part of uh, the quadratic formula. Do you, know, do you know the quadratic formula? Do you have that memorized offhand or no? Uh, quadratic formula yeah. is C squared equals A squared plus oh, B no, no, squared. Oh, no, no, you're thinking right? uh, Pythagorean no. theorem. Yeah, Pythagorean theorem. Oh, sorry. Quadratic yeah. formula. Quadratic formula is uh, it's, oh. it's it's a something you can use to solve for for a value of x in a quadratic equation. You've seen this before, I guarantee it. It's negative b plus or yeah. minus the square root of b squared minus four ac. Is this for, looking familiar? All over two a. Have you seen this before, Tanner? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've seen it before. Most students have. And that's if you know your, your A, B, and C values from the standard form. Uh, you just plug those in, and you can solve for what X is if, if that thing is equal to zero. Mm-hmm. Questions about that, or does, or does that make sense, what the quadratic formula is? That makes okay. sense. Yeah, okay. Now, the discriminant is the part of the quadratic formula underneath the square root sign here. It's the B squared minus 4AC part, okay? And here's why the discriminant helps you determine or judge how many solutions there are in a quadratic equation. Because if you calculate b squared minus 4ac and you get a positive number for b squared minus 4ac, then you'll get negative b plus or minus that square root. That's going to give you two solutions for x because plus or minus, like if the discriminant is like 16, you'll get the square root of 16. So negative b plus or minus, you know, 16, that's going to be plus 16 is one solution and minus 16 is another solution. There's two solutions for x if the discriminant is positive. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if the discriminant is zero, so you get a zero underneath the square root sign, b squared minus 4ac is zero, then uh, there's one solution to that quadratic equation because plus or minus zero is just the same. I mean, negative b plus or minus zero is the same as negative b. So it's going to be negative b over 2a is going to be your one solution to the quadratic. Does that make some sense why if the discriminant is zero, you get one solution? Yeah. Okay. And here's the funky thing. If you calculate the discriminant and you get something that's negative, so like let's say you got negative 16 for b squared minus 4ac. Can you even calculate the square root of negative 16? Mm, No. I don't think you can. Right? Because the square root means there's some number times itself that gives you negative 16. There's no number times itself that gives you negative 16. No real number. That's where they get to like imaginary numbers and stuff like that. It doesn't really play a role here exactly on this question. It's imaginary numbers. But, but it's worth knowing that if you get a negative value for the discriminant, for b squared minus 4ac, that means there's no real solutions to that quadratic equation. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. And in this question, they say the equation has no real solutions. So we know the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac. When we calculate that, that's got to be negative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which means that's less than zero. Okay. So what we got to do here is we basically got to figure out what our a, b, and c values are. We're going to, from this equation in the question... We're going to plug in those A, B, and C values into the discriminant. And uh, if that's less than zero, we're, we're just going to find out what C equals that gives us a value less than zero for the discriminant. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. Let's make it real clear first what are our A, B, and C values. First, what's our A value in this equation? Do you understand what I mean when I say what's our A value? Our A value is... Remember, A is the thing you're multiplying X squared by. Yeah. And you might look at it and you're like, well, I don't see anything in front of X squared. And it's true. We don't see anything. Yeah. So would it be zero? It's not zero, or right? Because if, if zero. it's zero, then there's there's no X squared. Zero times X squared is zero. But it's not zero. It's X squared. 
What number times x squared oh. is x squared? One. Yeah. The a value is one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You got to be able to identify that. You know. Yeah. Some students think it's zero, but it's not zero. You know, there's, there's an implied mm -hmm. one because one times x squared yeah. is the same as x squared. What's our b value? 34. Not 34. It's going to be negative 34. Do you see oh. why? Yeah. And yeah. it's easy to sort of ignore yeah. that negative sign there. I, I get it. Yeah. And then we don't know what C is. C is just C. <laughs> That's all it is. But if we plug those values into the discriminant, which we need to do here, I'm just going to work this out here on the whiteboard. This is what you get. You'll get negative 34 in parentheses. Got to use those parentheses. Squared minus 4 times AC. A is 1. C is just C, so I'll leave that there, is less than zero. Okay? Does that make sense so far? I'm just yeah. plugging in those values into the discriminant. We're just going to solve for the value of C that gives us something less than zero, something negative for the discriminant. What's a negative 34 squared? Do you have any idea? It should be just be the same as 34 squared. It is. Yeah, negative 34 squared. Yeah, it's a big number. What does that give us? Uh, 1,156. 1,156 minus 4C. 4 times 1 is the same as 4. We know that's less than 0. Let's get C alone. We're going to solve for C here. The C value gives us something negative for the discriminant. Uh, how could we solve for C here? I know it's an inequality. Some students kind of get intimidated by inequalities, but they work the same way equations do. What can we do to both sides to get C alone? Uh, divide by four. I, I wouldn't start there, right? Because we we could divide both sides by four. Uh, we could. I would probably just subtract 1,156 first. Which would give us a negative 4C is less than negative 1,156. Now we can divide by negative four on both sides. Yeah. We got a negative divided by negative that should end up positive. What does that what does that give us there? I'm punching into my calculator too. Two hundred and eighty-nine. Yeah, two hundred yeah, so eighty nine. C is less than positive two eighty nine. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Oh no, I did it wrong. I did it wrong. I did it wrong. Hold on. Oh, this is the this is I'm I, I'm glad we're going over this. If <laughs> Remember I said earlier, when you deal with inequalities, you're dealing with it just like you're dealing with um, equations. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. The tricky part is if you're multiplying or dividing by a negative, which we did here. This is part every student forget. A lot, a lot of students forget. And I forgot, too. You have to flip the direction of, uh, of the sign. Are you familiar with that? Have you heard that before? I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's just a thing. Be aware of that. We gotta flip, we're dividing by a negative, so i got to flip the direction of the sign. I knew it wasn't, it was, something was looking off. So it's C is greater than 289. We had oh, a yeah, direction of the yeah. Be really careful. Oh, boy, man, inequalities. Um, yeah, that's if you multiply or divide both sides by a negative, you've got to flip the direction of the sign. So Z is greater than 289. Okay. All right, good. Now we're, we're in a better place here because I was looking at the question. And the, notice the question says C is greater than N. Do you see that where it says that in the question? Yeah. Yeah. And we're trying to find the least possible value for n. Now, so, I mean, let's think about what this statement here means for c is greater than 289. So if, if c is 290 or 291 or 300 or, a hundred, you know, like 10,000 or a million, we'll get a negative value for the discriminant if it's anything greater than 289. Does that make some sense? Yeah. That's what we solve for. And... Um, and so if C is greater than 289, then the least possible value for N, this is not obvious, but I'm going to explain it here. The least possible value for N is 289. The reason for that is that if N is like, if N is, um, if N is something bigger than two, 289, if you're like N is like 290, then C has got to be, 290, you know, 290, so it's got to be something bigger than 290, which it could be, but C could be like 289.1, or it could be 289.2. So 
I'm getting a little bit lost here, actually, <laughs> in my description here. The the answer, look, it matches. N is going to be, two, the answer is 289. I think we're going to end it there. Okay. We're just going to leave it there. And, and this is really tricky to wrap your head around. It really is. Because it's easy to look at this and be like, hey, two, like, what if what if N is 288 or two, uh, 287 or something like that? But the problem is if N is 287, then like C could be 288. And we know C can't be 288. It's got to be greater than 289. That's why C can't be, two, uh, why N can't be 288 or 287. Does that make any sense at all? And you can say no. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. Okay, I'll, I'll take it. All right. Tanner, do you have any questions for me at the moment? No. Okay. Dude, that, that, on that discriminant question, I wouldn't even worry about that. Like I coach the vast majority of my students to skip discriminant questions because they're so freaking tough. And uh, mm-hmm. on a time test, that's probably a good idea. So if you see a question, uh, like I wouldn't, I, I would focus on the ones that you know how to solve for sure. Really interesting, I think, seeing the, the level of difficulty here between like 26 and 27, very high level of difficulty for both of those compared to pretty much every other question on this, uh, on this module. The, the early ones were much, much easier. So uh, don't worry about the few that are like really, really high level difficulty. Spend your time on the ones you should be getting right. That's really, the, should be the key to to a, a getting a good score increase on the test. Okay, Tanner, really, really appreciate your hard work um, and your attention here. Uh, and uh, thanks everybody for, for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel, all that stuff, and uh, be on the lookout for more digital SAT videos coming out soon. Thanks, Tanner. See ya.